England at war. The execution of a king. The rise of a dictatorship. Today on the History Chronicles, we will be exploring England's brief experiment with the abolition of the monarchy. In the year 1653, England was at a crossroads. The English Civil War, which had raged for a decade from 1642, had seen the growing conflict between the King and Parliament erupt into an orgy of war which had ravaged the country. The conflict had been triggered by a number of issues related to taxation, religion and, ultimately, the balance of power. King Charles I, who believed in his own divine right to rule, had increasingly ridden roughshod over a Parliament that grew more and more frustrated with a King who sought to limit its power. The war itself, fought between supporters of the King, the Royalists, and supporters of Parliament, the Parliamentarians, saw some of the largest and bloodiest battles ever fought on English soil. After a decade of fighting, however, the new model army of the Parliamentarians triumphed over an increasingly weakened and isolated Charles I. Following the fighting, a series of negotiations ensued which gained little ground in terms of providing a way forward for both parties. Then, in an unprecedented move, the King was put on trial. On the 30th of January 1649, King Charles I was beheaded in front of the banqueting house on Whitehall. He had asked for two shirts that morning, so he did not shiver on the cold winter's day. According to a royalist clergyman present, the crowd that had gathered to witness the king's execution let out a loud groan as the king's head fell to the ground. The king's death, however, did not end the discussion about how England was to be governed. Some members of parliament, MPs, had challenged the decision to execute Charles in the so-called Long Parliament that was called shortly before the king was put on trial. These members were then purged by one of the powerful leaders of the new model army, the victors of the Civil War. This leader, Colonel Thomas Pride, prevented 231 of Charles's supporters from entering the Parliament building. 45 were imprisoned. Of the MPs that remained, all were hostile to the monarchy. This rump parliament, so called because the word rump refers to the remnant of an animal, was to mark yet another decisive turning point in English history. A law formally abolishing the kingship was passed by the Rump Parliament on the 17th of March 1649. This was followed by a law to abolish the House of Lords, the component of the English government that was dominated by the aristocracy and clergy. On the 19th of May, a new act was passed in the House of Commons that officially declared England a Commonwealth. But those in charge of this new Commonwealth remained divided. Most of the MPs in the Rump Parliament were Protestant gentry who wished to promote godliness in society passing reforms such as the Adultery Act in 1650. This imposed the death penalty on breaking the bonds of marriage. However, these rumpers also sought to limit the influence of other Puritan groups that had sprung up in English society. Among these were the Quakers, who challenged religious procedure by dispensing for the need for clergy altogether, and the Ranters, who practiced a form of Christian pantheism and promoted the rights of the poor underclass. By 1653, the Rump Parliament had failed to emerge with any written constitution and had made themselves unpopular through a new assessment tax which affected anyone who owned property. From the Rump, a man stepped forward who had led the parliamentarians to success in the English Civil War and had been instrumental in the execution of the King. This man was Oliver Cromwell. On the 20th of April, Cromwell stood up in Parliament. You have sat too long for any good you have been doing lately. Depart, I say, and let us have done with you. In the name of God, go. The actual text of Cromwell's speech does not survive, unfortunately, but whatever he said on that day certainly was radical. Cromwell, who had the backing of the army, ordered for the Parliament chamber to be cleared. After a month's break, a new group of representatives was gathered. Cromwell seemed at this time wary of moving down the path of a military dictatorship. He could not officially call a parliament, since the long parliament could not be legally dissolved without its own consent. Instead, Cromwell left the decision to the Council of Officers, those in charge of the new model army that had remained the only source of real power in the aftermath of the English Civil War. Views from this council differed. 
Some wanted a small group of just 10 to 12 men who would act as a stable guiding hand until England was ready for a new parliament. Others advocated for a more biblical model of government, calling for a Sanhedrin of 70 godly men, after the ancient example of Israel. A number higher than this was eventually agreed upon. 140 men in all were nominated from the different regions of England, each according to its size and wealth. Wales and Ireland sent six, Scotland sent five. The method of nomination was thus. The Council of Officers chose whom they pleased, with a simple majority vote among themselves to confirm the appointment. The group that formed was even smaller than the rump parliament had been, and consisted of men drawn from the richest 5% of the population. This parliament became known as the Barebones Parliament, named after one of the MPs for the City of London, Praise God Barebones, an excellent name. Even this small niche group of hand-picked men though could not agree. Arguments erupted over a number of religious issues. One of these was the issue of tithes, taxes traditionally collected for the Catholic Church. If tithes were to be abolished by England's new Protestant rulers, what would replace them as a financial support for churches up and down the country? Another issue surrounded the state control of religion. Should there continue to be a publicly maintained ministry, as there had been previously? Or should, as the radicals proposed, state control over religious practice be abandoned altogether? On these and other issues, the bare-bones parliament was divided. This was coupled with the fact that these new members also had radically different worldviews. Some saw their role in the new government as the inauguration of a brand new world order, a day of the power of Christ, to quote one on the government's first day. Others saw it as a temporary feature, a caretaker government while the heated flames of the English Civil War and the execution of the King died down. As the year drew on, fewer and fewer members came to the House of Commons anyway. In all likelihood, they had lost faith in the government over these remaining divisions. Cromwell complained at the mismanagement of these amateurs, saying that he was more troubled now by the fool than before by the knave. Troubles in Parliament were exacerbated by continued war with the Dutch that had emerged out of a trade dispute and the threat of a royalist uprising up in Scotland. Soon, the moderates in this Parliament who supported Cromwell put forward a draft constitution that favoured Cromwell himself as the head of state. Cromwell, with whom they had discussed these plans, appeared to be increasingly sympathetic to such an idea. On a cold December day in 1653, Cromwell's supporters arrived early to the House of Commons to denounce its radical members for threatening the very fabric of English society. They marched out, the House Speaker before them, and resigned their authority to Cromwell. In just hours, a majority had signed a document of abdication. The Barebones Parliament was over. The man who was to take the helm of England in the wake of this crisis was a seemingly reluctant dictator. I saw that we were running headlong into confusion and disorder, Cromwell wrote about his accepting the position of the head of state. Otherwise we would necessarily run into blood. Cromwell accepted the title of Lord Protector from the Council of Officers. Although he refused the title of King, this role nevertheless gave him huge sweeping powers that made him a monarch in all but name. He swore to govern the country according to the new constitution and to the laws of the land. He received more of the country's wealth than the monarchy had enjoyed, gaining enough to maintain an army of 30,000 men and a sufficient fleet for power. He was to receive another £200,000 per year to maintain the civil government. He also received the authority to make laws until the creation of a new parliament which was to meet in September 1654. The main caveat to Cromwell's power came in his connection to the Council of Officers. He had to govern in all things by their advice. He also could not dismiss or appoint officers as a king might do. Under such terms, England's new government, the Protectorate, took shape in 1653. How then did Cromwell rule? I will leave it to a future video to explore a fuller story of Cromwell's Protectorate, but I will argue here that the traditional view of Cromwell as a detached Puritan dictator is somewhat of a misrepresentation. Cromwell's priority in the months before the new parliament was called was an answer to the religious question in England. Religious differences, after all, had been a huge cause of dissent and disagreement in the two parliaments preceding Cromwell's rule, and had been a cause of the civil war itself. Cromwell used his own temporary power to forge an answer to this question. 
it was laid down that there was to be a public profession of the Christian faith by the state, and that the state would set the guidelines for worship and belief in the parish churches. In March 1644, a body of commissioners called the Triads was set up to approve any candidate for the ministry. However, the commission itself and the rules that they applied were very broad. They consisted of Presbyterians, Independents and Baptists. They applied no doctrinal tests, but rather had to satisfy themselves that the candidate for the ministry was well grounded in the Christian faith and had a good standing in the community. Another group of commissioners would weed out any corrupt, greedy or licentious ministers. These had the striking name of the ejectors. Perhaps significantly, anyone who deviated from the state's profession of faith should be free to associate and practice their faith in their own way. In this religious settlement, Cromwell carefully managed the numerous Protestant factions and doctrinal beliefs that had gained political ground in the chaos of the English Civil War. His ruling embraced more of the laity and clergy in the Church of England than had been done since the Reformation. Even the Jews were readmitted to England under Cromwell's religious policy in 1656, in spite of a significant amount of opposition from his council. While Cromwell's leadership had of course been marked with harsh brutality, not least during his campaigns in Ireland, upon beginning his government, Cromwell as Lord Protector appeared to act for a more stable and united England. Cromwell remained in place as Lord Protector of England until his death in September 1658. Just like a monarchy, his title was inherited. His third son, Richard Cromwell, succeeded him as Lord Protector, but Richard's rule did not last long. After earning the dissatisfaction of the military leadership and many of the common soldiers, Richard was removed from power and replaced by yet another Council of State, returning the Rump Parliament in 1659. Its leader, General John Lambert, tried to maintain power in the face of dwindling support. His soldiers began to desert him while he faced down rivals in the north. Soon another general, George Monk, had his own army march down from Scotland to London to check Lambert's power. Monk had fought on both sides in the English Civil War, and had also served as governor for Scotland under the Cromwells. Monk was now ready to play a key but unintentional role in bringing the king back. With the imprisonment of Lambert, Monk organised the convention parliament which MPs could attend without declaring their allegiance to either king or commonwealth. Monk sent a secret message to the son of the beheaded Charles I, also called Charles, now living in exile in the Netherlands. In response, Parliament received a declaration from Charles, called the Declaration of Breda. Here, Charles stated that he would forgive any crimes committed by his old enemies. The convention parliament that assembled on the 25th of April 1660 mainly consisted of royalists that had already voiced their support for a return of the monarchy. On receipt of the Declaration of Breda, they asked Charles to return. On the 29th of May 1660, on his 30th birthday, Charles entered London. The new king was met with praise and adulation both by the crowds that gathered and by the new royalist parliament. The day in which he was received was made a public holiday, affectionately known as Oak Apple Day. After a decade of war, and another decade without a king entirely, England was now back with the monarchy again. Thank you very much for watching this episode of the History Chronicles. I hope you enjoyed it. Please do catch us for the next episode, which will explore the reign of Charles II in more detail. Like and subscribe, support us on Patreon if you can, and I'll see you again for some more history.